Welcome to Cage Minds MMA Show. I'm Micah Frankel. Whether you're watching or listening, it's appreciated. Hit like, share, subscribe, rate, and review. Take a couple seconds. It helps out a lot. Visit the website. It's cageminds.com. We have new merchandise available over at nmproshop.com. And also follow along on social media. On Facebook, it's Cage Minds Combat Sports News. On Instagram, it's at Cage Minds underscore CSN. And on Twitter, it's at Cage Minds MMA. Got my own Twitter, at Frankel Micah. Not to mention, if you can't get enough combat sports talk, I also do MMA after hours with Mr. Michael Carlisle. And if you enjoy professional wrestling, we have Pro Wrestling After Hours, both of those available on the After Hours Podcast Network that you can find at cageminds.com slash after hours. Also, if you enjoy just general sports talk, check out Mike Adams 2.0. I'm on every week playing sports fact or fiction. So a lot going on always, not to mention this past weekend, I was on commentary for Southwest Grapple Fest 2, presented by Combat Sports Club. Photos are up on the Facebook, thanks to Franklin Romero. And the pay-per-view is still available for purchase at CombatSportsClub.com. Now that we got all the particulars out of the way, Time to talk about UFC Fight Night London. That was the event that we were all focused on last week. Heavyweight main event. Could the Englishman live up to the hype, the expectations of a country? Number 11, Tom Aspinall, against the number 6 ranked, Alexander Volkov. And it's a first round submission win for Aspinall. How'd he do it? It was a popping jab. Man, does he have some fast hands. Gets into the clip, clinch, an outside trip. Gets Volkov down. The Russian is able to work his way back to a vertical base. This time it's a double leg, a blast forward double leg as Volkov is coming forward. Excellent timing from Aspinall. Gets the takedown. He lands in the half guard. Sets up the straight arm lock, and that's all she wrote. It's a quick victory. Aspinall is 5-0 in the UFC, an eight-fight win streak overall. All the expectations, all the pressure exceeds them. Great stuff there from Aspinall, and everybody already wondering what's next. Pretty savvy call-out calling out Taya Tuivasa. So Ivasa recognizing nobody's been drinking beers after their fights like I've been. And Aspinall tried to emulate that, but a great call out. Is it one that will come true though? Maybe. If Tuivasa doesn't get the interim heavyweight title fight against Stipe Miocic, which has been rumored for July, if that fight goes to John Jones, maybe you make Aspinall to Ivasa, maybe Tuivasa ends up fighting Surreal Gone. Possibly Tom Aspinall could be waiting for the winner of this weekend's main event. Because don't forget, the UFC back with a US, a U.S. UFC fight night this week in Columbus, Ohio. Curtis Blade's going to be taking on Chris Dawkins in that main event. So I'm already thinking the winner there. Pretty likely going to be matched up with Tom Aspinall in the next one. Because both of those guys kind of already hovering in the same place. If you look at Blades, he's a little bit higher, but is lost to the guys ahead of him. So, with a win over Dawkins, makes sense to have to, again, deter another charging prospect. But we're going to get to those guys later. Aspinall! Aspinall! Eight fight win streak. Incredible stuff. Co-main event, we saw Arnold Allen really unheralded Eight fight win streak coming in against Dan Hooker. Hooker coming down for 55 to 45. Looked like Mr. Olympia on the scale. An incredible weight cut. And from the get go, you could see Arnold Allen and the speed difference. The length was going to be daunting. Huge reach advantage for Hooker, but Allen right away started dissecting the legs, low calf kicks right away. His game plan was to slow down Hooker and keep him in one place. They started swinging and banging, and all of a sudden, 
You see that Allen is landing his left hooks, being able to get in between the hooker punches and making the hangman pay for it. They're both stunning each other actually with left hooks dropping to a knee. Looks stunned and hurt. But Allen is able to again put his offense together. A big left high kick hurts Hooker. Puts him on the fence. Starts unleashing strikes. Elbows until the ref jumps in. It's now nine wins in a row for Arnold Allen. Great low kicks and IQ is what I had as a critique about Allen coming in last week. That's how we assessed him. And all of those assessments reign true. The speed at 145 pounds just killed Dan Hooker. Time for him to reevaluate. The UFC has said that Hooker can do whatever he wants. I still think, optimally for him, it's competing at 155 pounds. That it's just too draining to compete at 145. It's not that his chin is gone, but I think the weight cut, not to mention the speed difference, eating a lot of shots in a very short period of time that was all detrimental to Dan Hooker. But the real story of the fight is Arnold Allen. An incredible, incredible performance. And now, what's next? Came in ranked at number 7. At worst, it's a matchup with Josh Emmett. At best, I'm guessing it's Calvin Cater. Because when you look at the rest of the division, we know the title fight set for 273 is where you're going to see... Chan Sung Jung versus Alexander Volkanovsky. And the winner automatically, we know, is fighting Max Holloway. Brian Ortega is fighting Yair Rodriguez. So that leaves Josh Emmett, Calvin Cater, to either fight each other or one of them takes on Arnold Allen. Now, in the feature fight, we saw Patty Pimbit get the first round rear naked choke submission of Rodrigo Vargas. Vargas actually with the right overhand knocks down Pimblet early. Pimblet fights back to his feet. They're still in the clinch, jockeying for position. Once Pimblet is able to get both feet on the ground because of Kazula going for the wrestling takedown, it's a judo toss from Pimblet. He's able to take advantage of the Kazula butterfly hooks trying to escape. Gives a little space. Pimblet takes the back. Locks in a body triangle and secures a rear naked choke. Excellent hand fighting from Pimblet. It's a four fight win streak. All first round finishes. There's a lot of hype, a lot of love of the personality there. Pimblet has something that you can't just manufacture. People care about him. He has a fan base, a very large one, that's filling up the stadium and going crazy for him. And that gives him an inept advantage over every other fighting in the sense of getting preferential placement on a card and preferential matchmaking. Let's be honest, Vargas 2-1, and one, or excuse me, 1-2, and two, coming into this fight in the octagon isn't the guy that you put in a feature fight position unless you're giving a prospect an opportunity to shine. It's not really a tune-up fight, but we're talking about a soft elevation. The UFC does not do it in a lot of cases. But in this sense, in this case, with Patty Pimblett, the UFC is choosing to look at the asset and see how they can build him up instead of just violently challenging him in a deep division with an incredible competitor. It's what they're doing and the UFC is going to do what they're doing. It's just before you get too much aboard the pipe train of Patty Plimley. If you want to buy a ticket, if you want to get on it, by all means do so. I don't see anything too scary yet except for the guy Cuts a ton, a ton of weight. Gets grossly out of shape in between fights. And, oh yeah, takes a lot of damage. Got caught with that right hand. It's a four-fight win streak for a reason. Yeah, it's 18-3. and three. It's a remarkable record. But there are a couple, if you're not willing to call them red flags, at least orange flags, to raise some doubt about Patty Plum. That's to say, there are, there are some holes in the game that can be exploited. But so far... Look good in two fights in the octagon. I'm just saying, buy with caution. In the welterweight division, Gunnar Nelson return.
first fight since September of 2019. It's three takedowns. It's eight minutes of back control time, ending each round on Takashi Sato's back, getting the unanimous decision victory. It was nearly embarrassing. It's like 140 landed strikes overall from Gunnar Nelson and just nine significant 14 overall from Sato. Paralyzed by the threat of the takedown, unable to understand the karate style that Nelson was coming out with him. It wasn't like Nelson landed 144 clean strikes. He landed some nice one on the feet, got his back position, and was peppering away at his opponent. Good to see Gunnar Nelson back in the octagon. Solid victory. One of the bigger moments of the night and more spectacular finishes came in the women's flyweight division from Meatball Molly McCann. The spinning back elbow third round knockout of Luana Carolina brought everyone to their feet. McCann, great head movement, avoiding the jab, getting on the inside, and just winging away with big overhands and hooks to start off the first round. That volume and output pressure and pace would wane in the second round as Carolina was having success in the clinch with her knees sticking in some elbows but you did see McCann get to the underhooks and get to the takedown three minutes of control time in the third round the knockout came in disgusting fashion as into the clinch in the third round Carolina had been dropping her right hand just to throw the elbow hadn't been quickly reasserting her defense and as they're in the clinch you could see McCann look over the left arm that was out of Carolina waiting for the elbow didn't see it had her elbow out loading up the whole time spins beautiful knockout crushing high energy huge impact devastating knockout Carolina this was a scary knockout down down for a while in scary scary fashion and the main card opened up with another devastating knockout Jai Herbert made it look like it was a bad decision early for Ilya Teporia to be moving up from featherweight to lightweight just because he couldn't get a fight ranked in the top 15 there at 145 jumping up to 55 because he needed to get action but still only 12 and 0 a super prospect Herbert a bit more experience and a huge reach advantage height reach advantage coming into this fight Herbert left high kick with the knockdown earlier had to pour you busted up and on the on his heels Taporia is able to get a takedown even with the Herbert fence grab Herbert back up lands a knee popping the mouth guard out of Taporia's mouth and it looked like had the Spaniard on the ropes as the bell rang for the first round into the second round, we get Taporia feeling confident, able to back Herbert up. Herbert, though, still popping away, able to angle using his jab. A left jab, right cross, miss. The left jab lands, the right cross misses, but a left hook to the body connects, and a right overhand puts the lights out. That sudden Ilya Taporia remains unbeaten and does it with a one punch knockout even up a weight class coming back from adversity there was a scene earlier in the week I'm sure many of you've seen it where you nearly had a fight in the lobby between Ilya Taporia and Patty Pimblett take the fact that Pimblett is a massive 155er who cuts down and Taporia looked very small against a massive 155er. There's a blah blah blah. No. There is bad blood. There is hatred. And I could see it selling. I think that there's an opportunity to make that fight and the fans would love it. But I could also understand from the Pimblet side that Taporia is a bad man that could send the hype train derailing very, very quickly. Pimblet, in his post-fight, in-cage interview, called out some big names, apparently. But doing his media scrum backstage, he talked about needing more zeros on the end of his check before actually fighting any of those names. 
I don't see the actuality of Pimblet versus Taporia being highly likely as much as I'd like to see it happen. Also on the main card, you saw Maquan Amitakani quickly submit Mike Grundy with an anaconda choke. Grundy tries to punch his way in, level changes, grabs a leg, left the neck out a little bit. Maquan goes for it, a couple adjustments, and it's a technical submission because Maquan puts Grundy all the way to sleep. It's his 13th submission victory, and it was possibly the biggest one of his career. Because with the three-fight skid, Americani knew he was fighting for his job. Top 15 ranked heavyweights, Sergei Pavlich gets the first round TKO victory over number 10 ranked Shamil Abdurmahimov. So we're basically sure those two are going to be switching in the rankings. You had... Shamil Dermahimov trying to punch to the inside to level change. Well, Pavlich was stopping that with combinations of hooks, catching Abdurmahimov on his entry. A right subtle punch. That's kind of like the hook. It, all right, excuse me. That's kind of like the uppercut, but a little more straight line coming in. Knocks down Abdurmahimov. A little bit of controversy as the Russian is complaining, or excuse me, that Abdurmahimov is complaining this fellow countryman was landing some of the hammer fist to the back of his head but that argument is not listened to by the referee it looks to be a clean finish on the replay and Pavlich 29 years old a three fight win streak another interesting young player added to the top of this heavyweight division and UFC 273 is going to see Jair Rosenstruck versus Marcin Tybura I think the winner of that fight is next up for Sergei Pavlich. In the light heavyweight division, Paul Craig, as he does, gets beat up and still manages to pull out the victory, submitting Nikita Krylov with a triangle choke. Craig improves to 5-0-1 in his last six. Krylov, a push kick right away, is caught by Craig. The two of them scramble on the ground after Krylov is able to add a pair of punches while bouncing on one foot and the scramble leads to Krylov on top in half guard they're battling between the guard pass and Craig being able to re-guard Krylov standing in the guard starts to land some huge shots it looks like you could have a stun hurt Paul Craig who then pulls on the arm and Nikita Krylov slips and falls into a triangle choke. Another huge comeback victory for the Scottish fighter. At 135 pounds, still unbeaten, get the unanimous decision victory is Jack Shore outdueling Timur Valiev. Valiev came out on fire, high volume, taking the first round, being active. Shore, his low kicks, his right hands were on point. That wins the second round. And then a knockdown, a takedown, and another knockdown. Earns a 10-8 from one judge and takes the third from the other two. Jack Shore, 15-0. Watch out for the left hook. He's packing some power in it. In women's strawweight action, Elise Reed defeats Corey McKenna by split decision. One judge goes all three rounds in McKenna's favor, but I thought that Reed's right hand in the first and the second was doing a lot of damage. It was the first round with the right hand, the second round with the left hook. McKenna was drawing her in and then getting blasted. It looked like great use of the four and a half inch reach advantage, but McKenna did have a huge third round, two and a half minutes of tap time of top time. I saw the first two rounds going in favor of Elise Reed and at least two judges agreed. And the night got started with Mohamed Mokayev improving to 6-0 and with a quick high elbow guillotine submission of Cody Dern. A step in left knee blasts Dern right on the chin for the knockdown. Mukaev slaps on the guillotine. Dern tries to slam his way out of it. A re-gripping, going to the high elbow while getting slammed, keeping his legs from 
getting tangled up and keeping the chest to chest forward pressure going. Incredible stuff from Mukayev. He was the prospect coming in that I was telling everybody to keep an eye on. Can't wait to see what he does in his next fight. Still just very young. 21 years old. The youngest fighter on the UFC roster. But again, like a three-time European amateur MMA world champion. So excited to see what he does in the future. And I think I forgot to mention what should be next for Paul Craig. Because Paul Craig, number nine in the light heavyweight division. Creeping up closer and closer to getting some of these big names. It's probably time that we ask... Where is Dominic Reyes? When is he coming back? I'm thinking Dominic Reyes versus Paul Craig would be a great one. Cut. This week in the UFC fight announcements, UFC 273 on April 9th has seen two fights turn into one. Chris Curtis and Albert Duraev are both out, so now their opponents, D. Christy Plessy and Anthony Hernandez, are just going to fight each other. It just makes sense. It's simpler that way. And the UFC fight night on April 16th has lost Mazik Bahar Darsani and Gavin Tucker. Now Pat Sabatini and TJ Laramie are going to face off in a featherweight matchup. So that's Two times that we're having this scenario, opponents, opponents lost. Nah, just slap the two other guys that are left together. UFC 274, the co-main event for the event on May 7th, is official. And you'll see a rematch a long time in the making of the inaugural women's strawweight world title fight. Rose Namajunas this time is defending against Carla Esparza, the UFC fight night. On May 21st, has added at middleweight knockout artist Chidi and Jakowani versus well rounded Dusko Totorovic. And the UFC 275 card, June 11th in Singapore, has added at middleweight Jacob Makun versus Brennan Allen. In Bellator news, it will be back to back events in Hawaii. Bellator 278 has been announced for April 22nd. A couple Bantamweight bouts announced for that card. We'll see Enrique Brazula versus Joss Hill and CJ Hamilton versus Jared Scoggins. Bellator 279 the next night, April 23rd, has added at lightweight, moving up to 155. Longtime featherweight staple Emmanuel Sanchez is going to be taking on Hawaii's own, making his Bellator debut, UFC vet Yancy Medeiros. At featherweight, Justin Gonzalez is going to be taking on Hawaii's own Kai Kamaka III. Bellator Paris, that's Bellator 180, has lost Kassan Ashibavov. And now Piotr Dysadelic will be taking on Pedro Carvalho. LFA News, April 8th, LFA 128. Vacant lightweight title match in the main event. Aaron McKenzie, 10 2 and 1, versus the 8 and 1 Lucas Cassius Clay. April 15th, LFA 129. It's going to be a heavyweight title fight as unbeaten champion Thomas Peterson defends against unbeaten challenger Waldo Cortez Acosta. For this PFL season has been announced. The first three events are going to be taking place at the eSports Arena in Arlington, Texas. PFL 1, April 20th, lightweights and light heavyweights. PFL 2, Featherweights and heavyweights for April 28th. PFL 3, welterweights and women's lightweights for May 6th. PFL 4, lightweights and light heavyweights for June 17th. PFL 5, which is going to be featherweights and heavyweights, June 24th. And PFL 6, welterweights and women's lightweights, that's Friday, July First, those last three are all scheduled for Atlanta, Georgia, a venue yet to be announced. And Bare Knuckle Fighting Championships has officially announced the signing of Jimmy Rivera. It was long kind of rumored that he was heading in that direction, but now it's official. 
This week is the final PFL Challenger Series event from Miami, Florida. It's going to be featuring the heavyweights, including UFC vet Bavon Lewis, who's moving up from actually having competed in the octagon at 185 pounds. Heard there was some bulking involved, no weight cutting. Going to see if his athleticism and just hopefully deeper gas tank, wider skill set is what will lead to success of what are, quite frankly, some sloppy heavyweights out there. We'll see how the Challenger Series opportunity works out for him. LFA 127 is also this week, Friday night. It's the first event for the LFA from Commerce, California. Vacant middleweight title fight in the main event. Ozzy Diaz, Bruno Assis, who can become the promotion's eighth middleweight champion. Six of the previous seven have earned UFC contracts. Diaz, a 31-year-old from California, is on a four-fight win streak. Diaz hasn't seen a third round as a professional fighter. Coming off a knockout of Logan Woods at LFA 94. And not to mention his second round knockout of Moses Murrieta at Lux 6. Assis, the 29-year-old from Brazil, is on a three-fight win streak. He's a black belt in BJJ, karate, and judo. He had two fights in Thai and FC. Ended both of those in submission, armbar, and triangle choke. And had a dominant, impressive Decision win out grappling Jalen Fuller in his LFA debut. The co-main event is in the featherweight division as Chase Gibson takes on Javier Garcia. Gibson has finishes in his last five fights. Three of those submissions, obviously the other two knockouts. He's won three of four, including a Darish choke of Ty Clark at LFA 94. Garcia, a former LFA title challenger, has won four of his last five. El Mariachi has five submissions, including a triangle choke of Timothy Tevis at LFA 104. The card's also going to include super prospect 4-0 Josh Wang Kim and some other familiar names to LFA fans. Tommy Aaron, Carly Pangeline, Lisa Malden, and Giovanni Cotto. On Saturday morning, fight fans, you have one X from one championship to look forward to. This is... The anniversary event for the promotion, 10 years in business, this is a huge deal. The one women's atom weight title is, world title is on the line in the main event as Grand Prix winner Stamp Fairtex challenges Angela Lee for the world title. Lee had been away, pregnancy and all, taking care of her family. Stamp Fairtex had won the Grand Prix to earn this opportunity. It's former world champion in Muay Thai and in kickboxing Stan Fairtex who transitioned to MMA taking on Angela Lee who's incredible on the ground. It's going to be amazing to see how this one plays out. You also have the special rules about. It's four three minute rounds. It's Demetrius Johnson. Yes, one of the greatest mixed martial artists ever, taking on Rod Tang, an incredible Muay Thai fighter. You're going to have one round of Muay Thai, one round of MMA, one round of Muay Thai, one round of MMA. It's a 12-minute fight overall. Let's see how this one works out. Then you also have the one flyweight world title on the line is Adriano Martins, defense against Yuyun Wakasaki. In a special welterweight attraction, Sinya Aoki gets his long-awaited grudge match with Yoshihira Akiyama. In Muay Thai action, former one MMA lightweight world champion Edward Furlong is going to take on Muay Thai legend Australia's John Wayne Parr. Featherweight Grand Prix kickboxing finals, Chingze. Alzaz versus Sidichai, the former Glory World Champion, featherweight kickboxing title fight, Superbon versus Marat Gregorian. You have Bantamweight kickboxing world title fight, Captain versus Kirk uh, Aimata, grappling 
special feature with Renner de Reiner, the two division glor uh, two division one world champion, taking on Andre Gravau and in Bantamweight Muay Thai world title fight, Nang O oh versus Avareddy Ramazanov. Not to mention the one debut of grappling prodigy Daniel Kelly. This is one of the biggest events in one history. So there's Muay Thai, there's kickboxing, there's grappling, and there's MMA. Four different combat sports in this one incredible card that I can't even count, honestly, how many world title fights there are. It's going to be an amazing day, and I think it even starts at a reasonable time, 10 a.m., Eastern 7 Pacific one championship from Singapore with their biggest event ever. Now Saturday a few hours later after they go off the air you have UFC fight night from Columbus. The first fight night in the United States outside of the Apex since February 29th when the UFC was in Norfolk, Virginia for the first Benavides versus Figueiredo fight. It's been so long since the UFC has been on the road with a crowd for a fight night. It's Columbus, Ohio. The fun on the prelims gets started at 4 p.m. Eastern. That's 1 Pacific main card at 7 Eastern. So that is 4 in the Pacific. Heavyweight main event, number 4 Curtis Razor Blades against number 8 Chris Dawkins. Blades has won 5 of 6 TKOs of... Junior Dos Santos, a unanimous decision of Alexander Volkov in 2020. But he did have the knockout loss to Derek Lewis. Rebounded this past September, beating Junior Rosenstruck by unanimous decision. Chris Dawkins, 12 wins, 11 come by knockout. In the UFC, he's knocked out names like Parker Porter, Alexei Olenek, and Shamil Abdurmahimov. You look at Dawkins, it's landing over 7 0.7 strikes per minute will Blades attempt 6 takedowns per 15 minutes. This is good old striker versus grappler. We've seen though before like when Blades put Junior Dos Santos to sleep that the threat of the takedown will open up the hands and Blades is all of 265 pounds a massive man. Coming in it feels like Dacus is going to have the speed advantage I don't know if you're left questioning his chin after the knockout loss to Derek Lewis, who probably is the hardest puncher on the planet. So you can't really question anybody that gets put to sleep by that man. So you're still looking for a long night. Dawkins has 100% takedown defense in his five UFC fights. He's only had to defend one Shamil Abdurmahimov takedown. We're going to see how good Dawkins' wrestling is. And what improvements has Blades made in the striking? And it's got to be brought up. Well, it's only three losses. And yes, coming off the decision over Rosenstrike. But it feels like Curtis Blades has been a forgotten man in the heavyweight division. You've lost twice to Francis Ngannou. Then you also had the knockout to Derek Lewis. People are questioning the tactics. They've questioned the chin. So they've questioned then... Can this man become a world champion? I've had a lot of beliefs in Curtis Blades because heavyweights get tired. We've seen what Steve Bamiochis was able to do putting a pressure and a pace on guys. And the party that is on bottom usually gets more tired than the massive ground and pound artists. So I've liked a lot of what Curtis Blades has done. We've seen him bust open over ring with elbows. We've seen dominating relentless takedown performances. But it's can he get this one to the ground because Dacus has shown an ultra level of proficiency with his striking having Chris clean boxing. Not big looping leaving opening kind of style. It's crisp and it's clean and it's coming at you to lay you down. The winner of this fight most likely is looking at a matchup with Tom Aspinall as this is 
four versus eight, that'd be a great landing place. Either Aspinall would have that opportunity to get past the Blades, a guy that's been in main events and been on the cusp of a world title fight, or you knock out the next best prospect in taking on Dawkins. I see the winner of this one having to take on the Englishman. In the co-main event, you have women's flyweight action, number seven, Joanna Wood taking on number 11, Alexa Grosso. Grosso looked like a whole new fighter since moving up from 115 to 125. Back-to-back -back decision wins over Ji Young Kim and Macy Barber. Well, Wood, got to bring it up, she's 2-4 and four in her last six. Her last two wins, a decision, a decision over Andrea Lee and over... Jessica I. So they're quality wins, but the two and four is quite troubling. Wood, she lands 6.7 strikes per minute. Well, Grosso lands 4.9. It's that Wood absorbs 4.55 to Grosso's 3.61. Wood is more active, but she takes more damage. Well, they're both, I think, about the same. It's actually a little bit better of a difference for Wood than it is for Grosso. But if you just look at the trajectory of where they're going, it feels like Wood has been going backwards. Grosso has found her division. She's being crisp. She's been clean. Well, we've seen Wood initiating more takedowns as of late. I think that the move up to 125 for Grosso has also improved the takedown defense. She's not getting muscled around. She's been able to put on some size. I'm saying that I think Alexa Grosso puts together a great performance in this fight. An intriguing one in the men's flyweight division in the fe in the feature fight as number two ring, Askar Askarov takes on number six, Kai Kara France. If the UFC is not going to go with the quartet fight of Moreno Figueiredo, I'd assume the winner of this one would be next in line for the Brazilian champion. Askarov, 11 finishes, 7 submissions, 4 knockouts. In the UFC, we've seen him with decisions over Tim Elliott, Pantoja, and Joseph Benavides. Kaikara France, 14 finishes, 11 by knockout. His last two wins putting out Rodrigo Borantin and the former Bantamweight champion of the world, Cody Garbrandt. Askarov lands 3.37 strikes per minute and he absorbs 2.65. Well, Cara France is more active but absorbs more. He lands 5.9 and absorbs 3.79. Askarov attempts three takedowns per 15 minutes and Cara France has 87% takedown defense, well equipped to scrambling, and has a decent guillotine. You have to figure that Askarov, well he is very defensively responsible, he has to want to get this fight to the ground, knowing that Cara France packs a dynamite. Cara France wanted a world title fight after knocking out Garbrandt. If he can do the same to Askarov, he gets that. If Askarov gets Cara France to the ground, is able to outwork him or get the submission, I think it's the same. A world title fight is on the line in the feature fight. A possibility for fight of the night comes one before where Matt Brown meets Brian Barberina in the welterweight division. Brown, 15 wins by knockout. His boxing has always been one of his best uh, attributes. And his last three wins have all come by the kibosh. Brian Barberina, 16 wins. 10 have come by knockout. And we know that Barberina is always willing to stick his face in there and get into a dirty fight. Now, Brown, Brown lands 3.68 strikes per minute. Well, Barberina, again, more active guy. 5.44, but again, the more active guy absorbs more. 4.77 strikes per minute. Well, you look at Brown, 2.68 strikes per minute absorbed. I like the power, and let's just say it, Barbarina gets hit too much. I like Matt Brown by knockout, because he's been able to find the sweet spot so many times before. Heavyweight action, Alaire Latifi takes on Alexia Lenik. Latifi, 15 wins, 10 finishes, 6 by knockout, 4 submissions. Alenik, 59 wins, 16 losses, 
46 submissions. He has to get the fight on the ground to be effective, especially as he's getting older here, nearing 50, slowing down, just not as fast as the younger guys. Latifi has 100% takedown defense, coming off of a split decision win over Tanner Bozier. Alenik will throw a lot, but he absorbs even more. He lands 3.55 strikes per minute, but absorbs 3.99. Latifi has to be tricked into throwing, only lands 1.84 per minute and absorbs 2.86. But wears the damage very well and Alenik is on a skid. Has fought five times in the last two years but has lost his last three. The prelims, their featured one is... Women's flyweight action, Mana Fior at number 13 is taking on the number 4 ranked Jennifer Maya Fiore in a fight win streak. Maya, 4-3 and three in her last 7, but she's been fighting at the top of the division. Always her grappling and her striking. Excellent Muay Thai have both been underrated. Fiore really been muscling fighters to the ground and looking for the ground and pound. It's going to be a lot harder to do that against... Jennifer Maya bit Fjord, putting herself in position for a world title shot with a win. You know, we're always trying to look for more bodies to get in front of Valentina Shevchenko. In the welterweight division, Max Griffin has an opportunity to break into the rankings as he takes on number 9, Neil Magny. Magny had been calling out for the Hamza Chimaev fight. Instead, staying active, getting this fight with Max Griffin. He's won 4 of 5, with the wins being over Jeff Neal, Robbie Lawler, Anthony Martin, and Lee Jingling, all by decision. Griffin, a three-fight win streak, a bit more excitement. Knockouts of Rabiz Brahima and Ken Song. Well, his most recent win was a decision over the natural-born killer, Carlos Condit. Magni lands 3.67 strikes per minute. Well, Griffin, 4.35. On the absorb side, Magni barely taking any damage. 2.06, a very technical fighter. Well, Griffin gets in there and mixes it up. His strikes landed to absorbed only slightly in favor of the landed because the absorbed is 3.97. We'll have to see a much more defensively responsible Max Griffin. He's going to be able to land a bomb against the always active, always bringing volume, Neil Magny. And it's interesting. Both of these fighters are about 50% on their takedown offense and defense. So look for that to cancel it out. Neil Magny always, though, making the clinch a vital aspect of his game plan. In the lightweight division, the 6-1 Slava Borchev, who's fighting out of Uriah Faber's team, Alpha Male, has a huge opportunity against Englishman Mark DeCasey. DeCasey, back-to-back losses to Rafael Vaziz and Alves. Well, Borchev, a four-fight win streak, five of his six wins are by knockout, a impressive UFC debut, getting taken down, getting back, and crushing Dakota Bush with a body shot. In ranked women's bantamweight action, former title challenger Sarah McMahon, who comes in at number 9, is taking on number 12 Brazilian Carolina Rosa. McMahon's last win came over Lena Lansberg about a little over two years ago. In that time, Rosa has debuted in the UFC and is 4-0 in the promotion. A 6-5 win streak overall. Excellent Muay Thai. And she just sent Betch Cohea into retirement in her last outing. Bantamweights, who are both on big hot streaks. Nana Bakrell, 12-2, taking on Chris Gutierrez, 17-3-2. Bakrell, training out of the Jackson Wink Academy, always working his striking with Brandon Gibson, is on a three-fight win streak, and all of them have come by the knockout. That's why I mentioned the striking coach, Guido Canetti. We've seen his power. Kevin Navidad and Brandon Davis, a pretty good Muay Thai coach, have all went to sleep from Donna Bakrell. On the other side, Chris Gutierrez, 5-0-1 in his last six, wins over Felipe Carrales, and Andre Ull stuck out to me with devastating leg kicks. Bakrell, 
Lance, 6.2 strikes per minute. Will Gutierrez, 4.63. Look for these two to be throwing the kits in sync just at each other, looking for the kill shot immediately. In flyweight action, David Dvorak in his 16 fight win streak, including three straight wins in the UFC, is going to be taking on Brazilian Matthias Nicolau. Nicolau on a four fight win streak. The Brazilian's last two wins in the octagon decisions over Manal Camp and Tim Elliott. But look out, he has four knockouts and five submissions. Well, Dvorak, 20 wins, eight submissions, eight knockouts, four decisions. He's coming off of submitting Juan Camilo Honduras by RNC in his last outing. Earlier on in the card, it's a huge one, a 13-fight card. We have the debuting Alishab Kareev, 13-0, coming off of a 2020 rear naked choke win on the Contender Series. Nine finishes, five by knockout, four by submission, taking on short-notice opponent, Dennis Tatulian, Tatulian, 10 and 5, has won 4 of his last 5, and 8 of his 9 finishes come by knockout. And to open up the card, it's featherweight action Luis Saldana versus Bruno Souza. Souza, a former LFA champion, who's a Leota Machida protege, a former, I said it already, LFA champion, a black belt in Machida karate who has 60% of his wins by decision, while Saldana, 15 wins, 14 finishes, 9 knockouts, 5 submissions for the MMA Lab protege, who won his UFC debut by decision over Jordan Griffin, and has overall won 4 of his last 5. So you got a UFC fight night, you got 1X, you got LFA 127, you've got the last week of the PFL Challenger Series. It's a busy week of MMA. Go over to CageMinds.com. We got an awesome interview up this week with Bare Knuckle FC competitor Chevy Bridges. And we're also going to be getting an interview and hopefully going up soon with Jojo Chavez, the first ever combat sports club grappling champion. Check out the photos again at the Cage Minds Combat Sports News Facebook page or on Instagram at Cage Minds underscore CSN. Pick up some merch and help out the cause. Again, that's at nmproshop.com. And the YouTube channel, because I didn't mention that earlier, it's Cage Minds MMA Show. Thanks for watching and for listening.